Welcome everybody to Everything Base. Today I'm actually doing a list. I'm doing the top 10 common mistakes most people make when they practice their instrument. And I'm gonna say the instrument because this is actually all valid to any kind of instrument study. So if you've joined in us, you're not a bass player, but the title got your eyes, um, well, welcome board. Um, you're, you're absolutely welcome here and please comment uh, anything you wanna add to uh, the discussion. But over, I've been teaching for over 30 years and I, and as a student, I started finding common mistakes I was making as a student and then con, common mistakes students were making when they were coming to me saying, I didn't get this, I don't understand this, I can't play this, uh, why am I not getting better faster? Wow, when I do clinics or um, in some previous uh, online courses, uh, I'd get a lot of emails saying, hey, I'm doing all this, but I'm not getting any better, what's wrong? And as I dig a little deeper and ask them questions, I'd find that sometimes, oh, always, they would fall into one of these 10 mistakes. So let's get right to them. Because I didn't want to miss, uh, miss anything, I have actually written them down, so I may be looking at my notes throughout this. Um, so number one, the complaint uh, or the mistake that most people make is they just always play what they can already play. Um, when I ask them, well, you know, well, what are you practicing? Why, you know, what are you practicing? Oh, you know, I'll put on some recordings and play along with them. Well, are they new recordings? Oh, no, the things I already know. That's a kind of practicing that makes you better at what you can already do. It's not expanding your musicianship. It's not introducing new things. So that by its very division, definition is making you plateau. And that's what gets frustrating when you're feeling like you're not getting any better. Uh, let's say you play all these songs and you play along, and I don't mean to pick on that, but let's say you just do the same finger and exercises you always do. You, you play along with the same songs and you call that your practice time. Then you go play with some friends and you kind of trip over yourself. You, they, they want to improvise over a section and you fall flat. Um, you have to, the, the, the corrections for these mistakes are always be looking for new material. And that's honestly one of the main motivations behind me starting these video lessons was that you guys would have it a, a, you know, free if you just did you know, watch on YouTube, it's free to get new concepts. So you're always trying to be playing something new. Um, uh, you could also just, you know, if, if maybe this isn't your style, maybe you're not good at learning off of videos, this is just something you're checking out on a whim, um, get a private instructor. Private instructors are phenomenal at always kind of pushing you to the next goal and showing you maybe goals you didn't even know existed. So f getting new material. Um, if you're, you know, if you're an accomplished player, you already have, you know, your degree in music, you touring and all these things, but you're still plateaued because honestly, plateaus happen to any player at any level. I'd encourage you to search out, go on to some of the different sites, that sell, websites that sell music books and theory books, find one that's interesting outside of what you already do. And, and I do this all the time. I'll go, oh, interesting, I don't know that. And I'll just you know, buy a copy of the book and I'll work through it. A lot of the books that I suggest as encore items, uh, I bought because I was looking for some new material. So that's the cure for number, number one mistake. Number two mistake that people make. Inconsistent practice schedule. Um, yeah, you know, uh, this is this is still a problem. I, I was gonna say it's not as bad as it was, but in in like you know in the 80s and 90s. But I still get people that they'll practice for like two hours on one day, but then not even touch the bass for two days, and then maybe they'll play like for 15 minutes on the next day, and then not touch the bass for three days, and then they wonder why am I not getting any better. And I don't mean to make light of this or make you guys feel bad. It's, you know, you might be thinking, well, I'm putting the time in. Developing your musicianship and your artistry, it can't be done in fits and starts. You have to kind of get a regular schedule. So for the correction for that mistake is to set up a calendar and stick to it. And what's great about this time of our lives is even on our phone, we have a great um, calendar on there. Um, there's some different apps like to do apps that you could use that give you reminders and things like that where you could just plug in find a consistent time it, it helps just like with working out at the gym it helps if you're like you know I'm going to do it on this day at this time and try and make that consistent so that you are less likely to forget if you don't have like something on your phone reminding you hey if you really if it's something you're passionate about set an alarm set an alarm so that if you're like normally home after five o'clock maybe set an alarm at six that's like this is your practice time and and make it consistent i do recommend at least five days a week i think 
you know, if you're passionate and you're enjoying practice, you can practice every day and not burn out. If you're struggling with and you're worried about burnout, then maybe take two days off. Um, ideally, not two days in a row. So it'd be great to do like three days and a day off and two days and a day off and three days and a day off and kind of alternate that. Um, I think that's more helpful and will help you get farther along. Uh, and at times you're going to be really excited. So you might do every day of the week. That's great. And at times, maybe even just your schedule gets crazy. Try to still make it five days a week, even if you have to trim down the time, but do regular every day. I had a teacher tell me it was more valuable in my sight reading to me read five minutes a day than an hour on one day and only five minutes every other day. He's like, no, that's not as helpful as just five minutes every day sight read something new. And he was right. All right, mistake number three, poor time management. Uh, I was super guilty of this before going to MI. And as a student at MI, our binder of material, and I'm not joking, we had multiple binders throughout the year this thick. Um, so you had all this material. So what's poor time management? That's sitting down, and let's say you're gonna start off with some warm-up exercises, and you spend 20 minutes on warm-up exercises. And then you're kind of getting a little bit tired already, your shoulders a little sore. Then you go to sight reading. Well, you're already kind of like a little bit worn out, and so maybe you do like five minutes of sight reading, and now you're 25 minutes in, and you're like, oh, that's enough. But you didn't get to your like scale practice, you didn't get to your arpeggio practicing, all that stuff. It's more effective, and again, you can use any of your devices or go and buy a cheap digital timer. Um, because of cell phones and iPads and computers having different timers on them, um, it's really cheap now to just go to the, like uh, your local supermarket or something and find a digital timer. I found some of them as low as like $5.99, and all you need to do is be able to put in five minutes. And that's funny, you might go, five minutes? But the way I'm teaching with like a technique exercise, slap grooves, scale practices, arpeggio practices, things like that, you can really hit, you can do a lot in five minutes. And you'll be surprised once you get in this habit how much you can do in five minutes. But what this means is you're allocating the same amount of time to every topic you want to cover. If you can do this consistently, first of all, you'll be fresher for the last item than you were if you did a long thing on the first exercise or whatever. Um, but you'll see consistent growth in all those areas. So I really, really encourage you to use that. I just use a timer on my phone now, but as a student at MI and even years after, I had a little magnetic um, kitchen timer that I just stuck onto my metal music stand and I could just sit uh, five minutes and hit start, be working, I'd be really into it, really loving it, and then the timer go off like, okay, and I'd stop and I'd go on the next thing. There's a cool benefit to this. So. Let's say you're sight reading and you sight read for like 30 minutes and you're kind of like at that, you're kind of like, oh, my mind's pudding, I'm tired. There's a little bit of a negative hangover. So the next day when you think about practicing sight reading, it's likely that you're going to be like, oh, you're going to remember that feeling. And that's not conducive to like approaching it with a positive open mind and doing it every day. When you restrict yourself to sight reading for five minutes, most likely you'll be like, oh, timer's off. Okay, that was great. And you have a different hangover. You have this kind of residual feeling of like, oh, I was good. I, I, I did well. I, you know, I got a little bit farther. I, I can do better. Next day you go to practice, you're like, oh, okay, no problem. You know, I, I, that was a good experience yesterday. Um, likewise, when you know it's just five minutes at a time, if there's a day you don't really feel like practicing, but you're just going to show some discipline, you're going to get to it. It helps knowing that, okay, it's just five minutes of this, five minutes of that, five minutes of that. To me, it helped. It inspired me to kind of sit down. And once I got into the flow, usually I got caught away with it and I was enjoying it. Uh, okay, so number four, distractions. <laughs> the first fix for this is get a room, guys. Uh, and it, although that's funny, it really, it's hard. And I know that this is not maybe, you know, there's a time in my life I've had roommates and I'll be practicing and I'll be practicing in kind of a common area and they come through and they're chatting with me and I'm distracted or they'll sit down and turn on the TV and I'll be like, ah, oh, okay. Um, so if at all possible, find a space that you can close in, uh, whether it's your bedroom, if you're lucky enough to have a bedroom by yourself, if there's a, a den and like you can get to the den or whatnot, um, in good weather, I've even taken stuff out in the backyard and practiced, you know, if, if there's too much chaos and distractions in the house. Um, basically, being able to isolate is important. Now, there's a new element. When I used to teach this 20 years ago, I didn't have to talk about what I'm going to talk about now. But now, it's getting disciplined to not look at your devices. Um, one of the quickest derailments um, 
is be practicing and see a text come through and then it's a friend talking about something and you're like, oh great, you know, and then all of a sudden you're like, you've cooled off. You're no longer on that kind of like flow and you're like, oh dang it, all right. And then, oh, I'm just gonna go to this. Uh, or even, you know, heck, I'm, you know, maybe you're practicing, you see, you know, you hit the bell icon below and you see it, you know, everything base is just uploading a new video. I'd hate for that to be a distraction for you. Um, it's always risky, you know, to say like maybe turn off your Wi-Fi or something like that because I don't want you to be then blame me if like an emergency came through but have the discipline to not let a casual or non-emergency text or notification or something come up try not to let that derail you um, now what I do because I'm you know I'm a husband and I'm a father and so I want to make sure that if I'm practicing my wife my daughter can always get to me I put my phone, yeah, I don't turn it off or anything, but I put it behind me um, so that, and they have, um, I have a do not disturb set up, but they have access. So their calls will come through, their texts will come through when I'm practicing. But I put it behind me so that if, you know, a video pops up, say, hey, someone so upload a video, I won't be distracted by it and I can focus on my sheet music or whatever I'm practicing at that time. That's just one suggestion. So I'm still reachable if there's an emergency but I'm not easily distracted by stuff that's not vital and not important because really what's the most important thing for your mental health and your, and some, some of you, your vocation is to practice. Don't let anything get in the way of that. So avoiding distractions, that's, that's the cure for the number four mistake. Number five mistake, trying to play too fast too soon. Now I mentioned this on my three answers video where I gave three answers to the most common problems people had, but it bears repeating the most common mistakes guys will come to me or message me and say man i'm just not getting this down and i'm so frustrated i was going really well and now I, i'm kind of stuck in a rut chances are uh, they're trying to play it too fast and i find this too with my slapping and tapping videos um, people comment me say i just can't get it down and i'll ask them well how, how are you practicing it and usually i can kind of get them to kind of admit that they're just trying to they want to get to the end they want to be able to have the end product of what i demonstrated now but you have to show patience don't try to play too fast too shoot too soon um i'd also say be smart with your metronome if you um you know again some instructors have a negative feeling to, to metronomes i think they have a place and i think drum machines have a place in your development if you want to make sure you're not trying to play too fast or sight read too fast, um, which would make you make a lot of mistakes, and then you're thinking that you're not a good sight reader and that negativity piles on, set a very slow tempo. So you're letting the metronome say, no, no, come back, stay right here, stay right here. That helps you have, I think, a healthier experience in your practicing. And I think that's super important. So metronome can really do that for you, being more patient, identifying the problem. Like, like when you're getting frustrated, like, ah, oh, I can't play this. Just, I hopefully now the first question is, are you trying to play it too fast? Because you can eliminate a lot of errors and stuff by just practicing slowly and working up to your target tempo. So keep that in mind. Uh, number six, forgetting where you left off last time. Man, um, in this crazy hustle and bustle world, sometimes we sit down and practice and we have a very short amount of time to practice. We want to be efficient from the first minute we sit down. And sometimes the biggest enemy of, of ours is that we sit down and we're like, oh, okay, well, what did I do last time? Well, I'll just read this page. And then you're like three, three minutes into it and you're like, oh, I, this is where I was last time. Or you're doing a technical exercise, you're playing along, and then you realize, um, oh, wait, I, I'd worked this up to a different tempo. And now I'm way back at the beginning tempo because you forgot where you left off. The, the fix for this is actually very simple, and that's um, keep a journal. And it doesn't, and it's not like, dear diary, today was a musical, musical day. No, no. A practice journal is not really, you don't put, uh, well, at least I don't put pros down. I don't write a bunch of stuff. I actually just put like, uh, let's say I'm working on arpeggio sequencing the major scale, which is a shameless plug for one of my videos. I would write down the date, what I'm practicing. So arpeggio sequencing major scales. And then I say like starting tempo and the, the, the key I was in. So let's say I was doing it that day in A major. So I'd write A major starting at 60 beats per minute. And then I practiced and I get it down. Then I maybe turn it up to, you know, 70 beats, 90 beats, whatever. I move to, you know, to a higher tempo, write down that. And I spend, and oop, five minutes went off. And I write down my, my starting and my finishing tempo. 
the next day, if you want to return to that and see if you can get it a little higher, don't necessarily start at the starting tempo, but don't start at the where you left off because you were warmed up, your mind was focused, you were warmed up. If you start where you left off, like if you start at 110 beats because that's where you ended the day four, you might, because it's not as fresh in your mind, you might make mistakes, get frustrated. Back it down like 20 beats per minute, work on it, and then see if you can get above that 110 mark. So being really good about notating in your journal is really good. Um, What's also very good about that is so a lot of times people feel they're not getting better, but they actually are getting better. But because you're with you every time you practice, you don't see the progress like you know private instructors. I can see the progress. And I try to tell students when I see them, I'll go, man, that's a lot better than last time. And they'll kind of look at me because they don't think it is. Well, a journal can help you with that. If after several weeks of practicing, you can go back and go, wow, you know, I was, I was doing this two octave fingering for the scale and I only got it up to 80 beats per minute, but now I can play it. Look, I can play it down here at 140 beats per minute. You know, I've really got it down or look, I, I, it took me forever to get it in the key of G, but now I've got it in all 12 keys because you can look on your journal and you can see progress. That's encouraging. We need encouragement. We need inspiration. And sometimes a simple journal can do it. Uh, I've done it both ways. I've had a actual, I go and buy a notebook at the 99 cent store for 99 cents. And I just, you know, it's a high school notebook and I just write down the day and what I'm practicing and the tempos and stuff like that. Or I've used my iPad and I found different software for that where I can actually write it down. Um, I kind of actually like the written, the paper copy. Um, but you, you know, try, try it both ways or try one way and, and then let me know in the comments how it works for you. But keeping a journal might seem like, oh, it seems like it's work, but it's extra benefit. Don't see it as extra work. And what it will do is make that first minute of your practice time valuable. So you don't have to ramp up to it. You're starting right where you need to be and you're going to have constant prog progress. Um, so number seven, the seventh mistake is not having a plan. Uh, the worst time you practice, you, you're the, probably the worst time I practice is when I sat down to practice and I'm looking around like, well, what am I going to, well, I guess I could do this or get to, even away from your instrument. If you have a break at work or driving, don't get in an accident, but driving, you can start thinking about like, okay. Uh, and this is again, kind of goes back to the journal because the journal will give you the plan. But, um, but being able to kind of sit there and think, okay, well, uh, you know, I want to be better at this. I want to be better at this. Um, you know, maybe I can do this. I'm going to order that book off online and add that to my practice. That's having a plan. That's having like, okay, in a couple months, I want to be better at this. Um, for all my Patreon subscribers who are Backstage Pass members, one of the benefits of, of becoming a Backstage Pass member um, is I'll also help you develop your plan, which is you're going to answer a bunch of questions. Um, like, what are your goals? What do you want out of this? Uh, is your, are you going to be going to a music school? Uh, do you want to be a session player? Um, you know, do you want to just, you know, you ultimately want to be in a band that plays metal and, and stuff like that? Because what that does, that informs what we should be working on and what, in what like order or what preference. Cause I think everyone, no matter the goals, they, there's certain foundations you have to have to be effective, but it'll let, it'll let me help you create a plan so you have targeted ideas. So once you become a Backstage Pass member, you can email me at dtiasdaletitus.com and uh, I'll help you set up a practice schedule. And part of that membership also means that we, you and I can check in throughout the month and I can see how it's going um, and kind of hopefully, especially if you're not able to have a private instructor, I can take that role on and kind of give you some guidance to like what you should shift to, what you're spending too much time on, answer questions for you. Uh, of course, you don't I mean, you can just comment below and ask questions, but it does take quite a bit of time for me to actually help you develop a really good uh, practice schedule. So that's why I kind of give it to my Patreon uh, members. But I'll answer questions for you in the comments or, or uh, on our Facebook group. Okay. Um, oh, and I should say that when you make a plan, you need to reassess it every month. Because sometimes you'll go, I think I want to work on this, and you work on it. But at the end of the month, like I usually do this towards like the last two days of the month, I'll start thinking... You know what? That book I bought eh, really isn't getting me to where I want to go. I think there's a better one out there. So I'll reassess or I'll say like, oh, I thought this was going to be really good, but it's not. And I'd rather spend time on this. Um, but don't do that just because it's hard. Don't do it because like, don't say like, oh, I was going to work on 16 note, you know, syncopations, but it's, you know, I'm going to go this way. 
in reality, you might just go, it's really hard. And so maybe review some of the other mistakes, see if you're doing any of them, see if you can see better progress that way. Don't give up just because it's difficult. Uh, number eight, futzing with gear. Oh my gosh, I have students that come sometimes and I'm trying to teach them. They're constantly like turning their knobs, going to the amp, turning the amp, playing things. It's like, quit futzing with the gear. You know, and I'm a big gearhead. I mean, I'll probably feature it in the future videos. I have a massive pedal setup. I use a lot of loopers. I have a drum machine. Um, but when I'm practicing, I don't futz with gear. And there's a couple things. If you find yourself, you don't have the discipline to not play with your toys and stuff, uh, I would say then just practice with your bass, a cable, and an amp. Try to maybe set that up differently or unplug the stuff that's a distraction and set it away. Um, because unless you're getting ready for a recording project or you're writing compositions and you need to work on the effects because you know effects and and all that stuff that's that's just part of an instrument but it can be a distraction if you're working on like your scales arpeggios sight reading ear training if you're constantly futzing with your gear if you're kind of like always playing with the gear it's taking away your attention and focus your focus has to be on the content that you're studying so get in the habit of, of just you know use basic gear develop some discipline um, what I've done when I, especially if I get a new toy that I really love playing with is, um, I'll say, okay, for the first hour of my practice, I'm not going to even touch it. But then I reward myself is like once that timer goes off and I'm done with my hour practice, I can do whatever I want with that toy. So it's kind of like the dessert after a meal, you're not really excited about eating or something. You're like, oh, okay, but I can't have that until I do this. And that's what I'm talking about. Discipline, getting that kind of discipline where you can put those things aside. Uh, number nine. Practicing mistakes. Um, I remember that quote, the enemy of excellent is the phrase good enough. Ah, that's good enough. Well, if we practice mistakes, we'll most likely perform mistakes. And what I mean by that, if you're doing a technical exercise and you're getting a lot of fret buzzes and rattles and, and misfrets and you play the wrong note, but you just kind of plow through it and stuff like that, um, you're practicing mistakes. And we are in... I don't think people can argue with this. We're going to perform how we practice. So if we practice with mistakes and with not like a high bar of quality of tone and we're practicing with bad tone and stuff, why would we think that when we get with the band and we're on stage, we're going to play any different? So you have to develop a filter like, okay, I'm going to filter out the mistakes. Oh, I did that exercise. Mm, that was pretty bad. I'm going to slow the tempo down and do it until I can do it cleanly. Um, I've said this in previous videos, um, but you know, you always hear practice makes perfect, practice makes perfect, practice makes perfect. But when I was at MI, I, it was revealed to me from a teacher that the entire quote is practice makes perfect only if it's perfect practice. So it, if you just practice garbage, your playing is going to be garbage. If you practice with good technique, good tone, focused studies, and everything is the best you can be, when you get on stage to perform, it'll be so much better. You'll, you won't transfer mistakes onto the stage as much. Hey, we all make mistakes, but you'll have a better chance of, of eliminating most of them if you just practice more cleanly and with intent. Like, okay, I'm gonna make sure I can play this cleanly. Listen, plug in when you practice so you can hear. Because sometimes when we practice un unamplified, we're not hearing that we're not getting good tone and the volumes aren't even, things like that. Um, what is that, aim small, miss small? So if you just really listen for all those small details and you get them as good as they can be, you're going to be excellent. Lastly, the last of the 10 common mistakes everyone seems to make, not asking for help. Uh, hey man, by our very design, most musicians, we're kind of egotistical. We kind of like, no, I'll do it on my own. I don't want to show weakness to somebody. And that's really uh, inviting two things. Plateauing, which means you get to a certain point, you can't get better, but your, your pride's not letting you ask questions and look for help. Or you practice things wrong. Like, especially, I find this when people are like trying to apply uh, theory, but they misunderstand a concept, they confuse maybe different scales and modes, they maybe didn't read something and thought they were doing it right, and then now they're wondering why it sounds bad when they do it. Um, you have to develop an openness, an openness. And I'm that guy for you. You can ask questions, ask me for help. That's what the comment section's for. That's why I give you guys my personal email address, dtitus at daletitus.com. Ask me those questions. Um, reach out to me. If for some reason it's not convenient or you don't feel comfortable, reach out to me. There has to be someone in your environment that you can ask. Don't necessarily feel it has to be another bass player. 
Um, most of my stuff that's not technique oriented, like not slap or tap or anything like that, where it's, you know, it's really unique to the instrument there, I can ask most questions to former guitar teachers I had, you know, that I worked with at MI, drum instructors where I'm working on something. There's so many people I can ask, and they're not even bass players, and they get me over the top. So I encourage you, ask for help, seek it out. Um, so use everything bass. The, one of the things I love is um, instead of thinking about this is everything bass and this is me and all the questions are coming here and all the answers are going there, this is everything bass. I'm just part of it. And so if you have a question, if, if you like, if you ran into things like I'm having a trouble playing over rhythm changes, I'm just using that as an example, and you post it in the comment below, I guarantee you you're going to get other people going, oh, well, try this and, and then I'll chime in. I'll always chime in and say, I'll give you maybe my two cents. Have you tried maybe going back and working on your arpeggios or something like that? Um, so we're a collective and we're stronger for it. So ask us, ask us and no judgment. Now, if I feel somebody like if someone asks a question, and you think it's a stupid question, which is impossible. Um, but if you go, Hey, uh, you know, don't, don't tease them about it. Be helpful. And if you can't be helpful, just don't comment because I want to be encouragement. I don't want them to feel bad for asking because that creates a bad atmosphere for us all to grow better because I am wholehearted. I've already seen it. A question is asked in the Facebook group. Someone answered it. I read their answer. I'm like, that's fascinating. I've become better. So I'm really wanting this interchange of ideas. So, uh, so seek out help. Don't do that. So I'm going to quickly summarize the 10 mistakes. So maybe you can just mentally go through them when you hear them in a list and say, oh, I do that. I do that. And correct them and you'll be a better player for it. Number one, just playing what you already do. Number two, inconsistent practice schedule. Number three, poor time management. Number four, distractions. Number five, trying to play something too fast too soon. Number six, forgetting where you left off the last practice time. Number seven, not having a plan. Number eight, futzing with your gear. Number nine, practicing mistakes. And number 10, not asking for help. So the 10 common mistakes made by most people, well not most, made by people when they practice, if you can eliminate those, your practice time becomes valuable. It can't not become valuable. It's impossible. If you do, if you eliminate all those 10 mistakes, your practice time will bear more fruit. Now I'm going to leave you with one last thing. If you wanted to call it the encore item, I, I wasn't going to do an encore item, but one last thing is, is um, early on in my life, I uh, was because of a job I, I was um, doing at the time, I was sent to a Tony Robbins marketing um, seminar class thing and it's because I was part of a marketing department and um, he introduced a an concept which I'm not sure I applied to marketing but I applied it to my everyday musical life and it was called Kanai C-A-N-I constant and never-ending improvement and his concept has been how I have become the player I am and that is um, commit that every day you'll get incrementally a little better Constant is the big word there. Don't like have big peak. Like one day you, you just break through a bunch of barriers and you're awesome and you're like, great. And I, and I love those days. They happen for me still. Um, but then plateauing the next day. Make sure that every time you practice, you're getting a little bit better. Don't get in the trap of being comfortable. We shouldn't be comfortable when we practice. We should be a little uncomfortable. We should be like, oh, this is hard or this is new or wow, why is this not flowing like it should be? That means it's a, a weakness and you're strengthening it up. So focus on constant and never-ending improvement. Not huge leaps every day. That's, on, that's not realistic, but just a little bit. If, if at the end of a practice, you sit back and you go, man, that wasn't that great. I don't feel I'm any better. Well, then at least memorize the notes of a key or memorize the notes of a scale or in the very least go, okay, A minor seven arpeggio, A, C, E, G. Boom, you're incrementally and consistently a little better. All right. That's what I'm sending you for, guys. I just, I love sharing these ideas. I hope they help break down these obstacles that are keeping you from having the most productive practice schedule and getting to be the player you dream of being because everyone can, I promise you. It's not an elitist group. Like everyone can be a great bass player. Everyone can play and um, have the capacity to play the music they feel inside, but it takes work and it takes intentionality and you have to be good in your practice health. You have to have a healthy practice schedule. 
All right, guys, thank you so much. Please like, share, subscribe this video. I really would love for you to become a subscriber to the channel. And as I mentioned before, if you if you find you need more resources, me need more resources, go to Everything Base, uh, our Patreon account, patreon.com forward slash everything base. Become a monthly subscriber uh, to the Backstage Pass and uh, download away. Let, uh, let me be that resource for you. So thank you so much, and I will see you at the next lesson.